Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Evolving Landscape of Lung Cancer Treatment. I am Shelley Mulock of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more, visit thermofisher.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them in the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Professor Michael Thomas. Professor Michael Thomas heads the Department of Thoracic Oncology at the Thorax Clinic, University of Heidelberg, and is a member of the Board of Directors of the National Center on Tumor Diseases in Heidelberg. For a complete biography of today's speaker, click the name in the presenter's window. Michael, you may now begin your presentation. Hello, my name is Michael Thomas. I'm the head of the Department of Thoracic Oncology at the Thoris Clinic at University uh, of Heidelberg. Uh, and today I would like to go with you on a journey on the evolving landscape of lung cancer treatment. Here are my disclosures. And my focus today will particularly on non-small cell lung cancer and at the key date of diagnosis, around 60% of patients present with local regional disease and 40% of patients have metastatic disease. And if you would step back 20 years ago, uh, we would have had this counseling situation in the metastatic disease scenario. Unfortunately, there is no cure. There is not even a race for a cure. And this due to the um, uh, results here from the comparison of different chemotherapy regimens uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And you see uh, independent which combination you would have chosen. Two-year survival rate is around 10%. So nine out of 10% would not uh, be still alive after two years uh, in the metastatic scenario with this type of treatments. And this has changed substantially. As you see here, this is an epidemiologic analysis published 2020 in the New England Journal. And this is reflecting the lung cancer incidence and incidence-based mortality gender-specific in men and in women. It's based on the US CR registry. And the blue curve is representing the incidence in total. And you see, fortunately, the incidence is dropping down in men uh, substantially and in women modestly, but the mortality rate is even dropping down steeper, at least since 2013, minus 6.3 for men and minus 5.1 for women. It's the steeper, steeper drop down than the incidence. And this shows there is something in, in the population that now is uh, improving the outcome and is reducing mortality. And this has been indeed the introduction of targeted treatments uh, five to eight years prior to this key date of uh, 2013. And here uh, on the next slide, you'll see the molecular pie chart. It's, it's very important uh, to know the molecular subsets, uh, particularly in adenocarcinoma. And as you see, around 50% of patients could be attributed to different molecular phenotypes which are prone to targeted treatments uh, and these patient populations uh, will really benefit from this type of treatment with a differential effect in outcome, which I will elucidate uh, in the next minutes uh, while we walk further into those treatment conceptions. Um, the first one and the most prominent one introduced uh, into this molecular scenario has been the EGFR mutation. Uh, so molecular alterations of the EGF receptor. And here this cartoon reflects the response rate on the one hand and progression-free survival on the other hand. And in first-line treatment, we see 
a response rate of around 75%, for instance, for ozimertinib, um, a TKI which has been introduced into the treatment scenario around five, four or five years ago. And you see the uh, progression-free survival time in the median is 18 to 19 months. And the blue spotted box is indicating median overall survival. It's 38.6 months for this compound. Though so this is something uh, which really offers a benefit to the patients with these alterations. And um, at least it's important then if patients elapse to control with this type of treatment, are there further underlying molecular mechanisms of escape that could be perhaps uh, utilized for next treatment steps? And so it's very important uh, to have a re-biopsy or at least a reassessment of a change of the molecular pattern, uh, which is um, at best done by tissue or if it's not possible by circulating tumor DNA. And uh, on the left hand, you see again the molecular pie chart uh, of molecular alterations after failure of first-line ozimertinib treatment. And uh, in the lighter gray, uh, there it uh, is a type uh, part of the pie chart indicating transformation. That means that those patients experience transformation into small cell lung cancer, and this only can be diagnosed on, on uh, the tissue biopsy. Um, and here in the molecular scenario, you see most prominent and predominant are MET amplifications, uh, which is yellow colored. It's around 15% of the patient population, in particular for this part of the population, uh, treatment uh, opportunities are out, at least in the context of clinical trials. We have seen last ESMO, uh, the results from the INSIGHT 2 trial, the phase 2 trial, which has explored ozimertinib in combination with tebotinib, which is a CMET uh, inhibitor. Um, and you see response rate uh, is uh, meeting 50% or even higher. So it's effective, this combination. And the enrichment strategy and detection strategy for those patients has been based uh, tissue based on fish analysis or liquid biopsy based on NGS analysis by the ARCA technology. And threshold has been a met copy number gain of 2.3 in the liquid or over five in the tissue. And by this enrichment strategy, this combination is exerting those effects that I just showed. And further opportunities are around in those patients with MET alterations or with MET amplification, particularly after failure of first-line ozimertinib. So a further opportunity, for instance, is a combination of amiwantanab with larsertinib. Amiwantanab uh, is a bispecific antibody targeting uh, CMET and um, the EGF receptor. And here in combination with larsertinib, which is, this, uh, which is a third line uh, TKI uh, tackling the EGF receptor as well. And this combination, as you see, exerts efficiency rates around 33%. And ozimertinib and zavolitinib uh, is again a combination uh, with uh, MET TKI. It's the other compound than tebotinib. If you stick to the uh, CMET domain, um, here you see that these opportunities uh, are broadly set up. And uh, so it's not only tebotinib, which is in the field, it's savolitinib, which is tested, or amiwantanab with lazertinib. And if we walk further forward, what are other options? If patients elapse uh, towards uh, TKI treatment options, antibody drug conjugates work into the field as well. And uh, the both to mention here is patritumab deruxtecan, which is targeting HER3, and datopotumab deruxtecan, which is targeting uh, TROP2. And you see those antibody drug conjugates exert similar response rates 
30 to 40 percent antibody uh, drug conjugates. Uh, by um, this conceptual slide are designed in that way that we have a toxic payload that is linked to uh, the FC fragment of the antibody and the FAB fragment then is detecting the respective antigen after antigen binding. Uh, the internalization via endocytosis um, is then uh, uh, there and with that then uh, the lysosome uh, is uh, then degrading intracellularly uh, this antibody drug conjugate and then a release of the toxic, the toxic payload is taking place uh, and toxic payload might uh, exert efficiency intracellular on the one hand by DNA intercalation or on the other hand by microtubule disruption and then drive forward apoptotic cell deaths. So this is the mode of action of those antibody drug conjugates and uh, which I would like to emphasize and stress it's very important uh, to even know very tiny populations which prevail in the one to two percent range if it comes to target treatment because those target treatment options might offer a substantial benefit to patients and one example for instance here are EGFR exon 20 insurgents, it's, uh, insurgents. So we still discuss on alterations in the EGF receptor and here it's exon 20 insertion. It uh, has a prevalence of around one to two percent with different uh, insertion types even here. Uh, those um, um, tumors characterized by these insertions carry a worse prognosis and are a good target for various new options. And here again, amiwantamab, this bispecific antibody that I already mentioned, is in the field and received approval for second line treatment. Uh, it's here in the uh, colored uh, box highlighted amiwantamab. Uh, tested in the uh, Chrysalis trial package is showing a response rate of 40% and a median duration uh, of response of 11 months. But you see uh, this scenario is, is getting more and more crowded. Uh, further TKIs are introduced and tested, Mobocertinib here to mention, or Zunvocertinib, CLN081, we have um, uh, seen last ESCO for the first time uh, in a phase phase one setting, showing response rate of 40%, median duration of response of 10 months. And a uh, particular feature is that this compound is showing a very good brain efficiency if brain metastasis are cure. And if you compare here by this um, reflection in early trials, mobocerotinib is exerting uh, the best median duration of response with around 18 18 months and overall response rate of 28, uh, 28%. So this is just to mention that there is a plenty of opportunities for a tiny patient population. And uh, the molecular landscape has been nicely assembled here in this pie chart by uh, Daniel Tan. Uh, he published this uh, oversight paper in JCO last year. And the outer part of the pie chart is reflecting the Asian population and the inner part of the pie chart, the Western population. And you see uh, in the Asian population, uh, it's less than one third of patients that have uh, a molecular undefined type of disease. Uh, for the Western part of the population, it's around 40%. So there are, here are differences and which I would like to stress again are uh, the tiny uh, patient populations egfr exon 20 insertion i did already mention and other representative are her two exon 20 insertions which prevail uh, around one to two percent in total and here we have an adc an antibody drug conjugate which has been introduced into the treatment scenario uh, trastuzumab deruxtecane tested in the destiny trial package and you see in advanced treatment lines here an overall response rate of more than 50%, median duration of response nine months, 
and here uh, in the slide different different doses are depicted and for 6.4 milligram per kilogram body weight um, we have to see and we have to uh, uh, notice that the um, rate of interstitial lung disease or pneumonitis is quite relevant. Here in this trial, uh, it has been 14%. In the lower dose, it's only around 6%. And uh, so it's important to know that and step to the lower dose if you start this, uh, if you start this ADC. Uh, because pneumonitis is, is really important, it's really mattering to patients. And uh, you could at least diminish the risk by stepping down, uh, down in the dose. And uh, here in this trial, it could be shown that it shows equivalent efficiency in terms of response rate, the lower dose. So it's always important uh, to balance against the side effects and, and see what is the utility and efficiency. Of those compounds. Uh, I now step back to the pie chart that I already showed and you see uh, one further relevant domain are KRAS altered patients. In total these comprise 25 percent of adenocarcinoma patients and around 50 percent of them have KRAS G12C alteration. Here in the pie chart reflected as 14 percent of the total population and here um, you see, uh, here is again the taxonomy, KRS, uh, in total 25%, KRS, G12C, uh, 12 to 14%. And here on the right hand, there is a list of different GDPase inhibitors that block the KRS protein in the inactive state. And you see, this is very crowded. It's reflecting here more than 12 of those GDPase inhibitors. Uh, so it could be shown that their efficiency might be exerted by blocking KRAS in the GDPA state. Uh, and uh, the field is getting crowded very quickly. The first efficiency readouts we have seen on Sotarasib and Adacrasib here in comparison uh, in the discussion uh, uh, from last ESCO. And we see in the phase two settings that response rates are around 40% with median duration of response of 8.5 and 11.1 respectively, median progression-free survival around six months, median overall survival around 12 months. So no major differences uh, between uh, those uh, GDPase inhibitors. Um, and uh, Sotarasib then uh, made it forward into the phase three trial setting and the results of the phase three trial in comparison here, Sotarasib to Docetaxel in the second line setting have been presented at last ESMO. And you see here in, in phase three response rate is 80, uh, is 28% for Sotarasib compared to 13 for Docetaxel. And the one year progression free uh, survival rate is 24 uh, co percent compared to 10 percent so there is an advantage uh, but it's not so tremendous tremendous it's there and Sotorazib received approval uh, for treatment so it's an, a, a further accomplishment here in those treatment lines and a further offer to patients uh, that could help uh, to control the disease for a certain time period in terms of overall survival, with a crossover rate of around one-third of patients with docetaxel crossing over to sotorazib, no difference in overall survival could be shown. So uh, with these results, it seems to be important to think about uh, okay, how the effect could be increased, perhaps by combination strategies, uh, with other TKI options that interfere potentially with the RAS pathway or with uh, other options that increase immunogenicity uh, with IO combinations. This is depicted here in this graph and uh, the graph as well depicts that with, with GDPase inhibitor, inhibition of KRS, G12 CVC response rate of 30 to 40 percent and uh, in those patients 
uh, with these alterations, we even see if you look on cold expirations that immunotherapy might work in a substantial proportion, which is completely different in the typical targeted treatment, targeted populations prone to targeted treatments with the classic EGFR alterations, uh, L858R in exon 21 or uh, exon 90 deletion or elk gene fusions, ROS gene fusions, red one, uh, red gene fusions. Here we see response rates um, um, uh, tackling 80% and those uh, uh, defined populations are not prone to immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is not working efficiently here, though these are differences. And which, uh, what I would like to stress, it's important to think about how to increase oh. the treatment efficiency in the KRS population by the options that are outlined here. So to summarize here, if we put this into an overnight uh, table, we have to state that by the various uh, options of targeted treatments according to the respective molecular alterations, we have the response rates as outlined here and progression-free survival times as uh, depicted here in the table as well and overall survival uh, and median overall survival as depicted uh, here in the table. Uh, and uh, you can take away that for the classic EGFR alterations, uh, median survival might even uh, might even meet 38, 39 uh, in the median by ozimatinib, which I already have shown. So this is, let's say, in that way, the best population with the best benefit in terms of TKI treatment. Now I would like to jump over to gene fusions and here to name four potential fusion genes, ELK, RED, NTREC1, and ROS1. And if you look with those gene fusions again on the table, you see, for instance, for ELK, you could achieve a five-year survival rate of 60%. So this is really a tremendous step forward for those patients. And in the patients with RED fusions, three-year survival rates of 57% are already reported and with further follow-up of those trials even might meet uh, a five-year rate of 50% as well here. So these are really substantial steps forward in the gene fusion domain and it's very important uh, to detect those gene fusions. And here to say that uh, besides DNA NGS for the mutations, RNA NGS for the gene fusions is very important and a very important tool when it comes to diagnostics. And even with RNA NGS, you can um, uh, you can confer further informations uh, to the treatment of patients. Uh, for instance, uh, the fusion partner can be described by this methodology. And here uh, I would like to show you on this cartoon uh, the biological background uh, in the ELK gene fusion scenario. And here are some of our own data integrated as well, which we, uh, uh, which we achieved uh, and provided by code exploration in our own patient cohorts uh, that we diagnosed with this, type of uh, with this type of disease and which we treated either with chemo or TKI options. And you see, again, the molecular um, pie chart indicating ELK is comprising 3 to 5% of the total population in adenocarcinoma. Uh, the gene fusion is defined by an inversion of the short arm of chromosome 2 with a defined cut point in the ELK domain, various cut, point, cut points in the EMIL4 domain. And according to the cut point in email 4, then you have as a readout different variants in the protein. And the most prevalent ones are the variant V1, V2, and uh, V3. And um, you see if V3 is given, those patients upfront show a higher metastatic burden and uh, substantially shorter time intervals of progression-free uh, time progression-free survival with TKI treatment. So they step very quickly forward from progression to progression and then succumb earlier 
than those ones with V1 or V2 due to their disease. Uh, and this we detected and this we explored uh, by the iron torrent amp uh, AmpliSeq technology uh, um, and, and, and could show that this is given in this uh, population. In addition, uh, we could show that the occurrence of a P53 co-mutation is conferring to even worse outcome, either as an upfront alteration, there the prevalence is 20%, or if it occurs over time. And here an additional uh, incidence of 20% has to be stated. And this we could check by ctDNA tracking over time, the occurrence of P53, P53 co-mutations. And we could, uh, we could even detect by ctDNA tracking early relapse of disease by uh, looking on the variant allele frequency. Uh, and this uh, indicated relapse with a lead time of four months prior to relapse in the imagings. And in addition, uh, by doing in-depth analysis of the ctDNA, we even could uh, could uh, check back is there a, a resistance mutation in the uh, in the elk gene given uh, which could then offer uh, a next type of treatment potentially as it's an on target resistance that is occurring here so a lot of information by doing appropriate genetic analysis upfront and even over time and with that uh, i would like to state here uh, with particularly with the genomic landscape, uh, which is now uh, a background of disease in non-small cell lung cancer, definitely to say one size does not fit for all. And you really should know with which part of, your, of the population you are dealing with to employ appropriate treatment and to move forward into the target treatment space. A major step forward, a really transition of the treatment field uh, has been given by um, employing tumor in micro, uh, tumor microenvironment to eradicate cancer and to really go forward, forward to cancer cure. And here a landmark trial has been the Keynote 024 trial, which employed uh, a PD-1 checkpoint inhibition, here in this case, pembrolizumab, um, uh, against uh, metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. And uh, this opportunity has been compared to chemotherapy, combination chemotherapy, which has been the standard of care in these times. And the updated trial showed in 2021 that a five-year survival rate with checkpoint inhibition in the PDL one high uh, expresses uh, expressing a PDL1 uh, of more than 50%. Uh, uh, the five year survival rate here has been 30% compared to 16% with combination chemotherapy. Though this has been a really step forward and a proof of concept in this treatment field. Um, and here again, uh, the molecular landscape. Uh, might play a role, at least it has been shown in this retrospective analysis published 2021 by Recutian co-workers, just in this population that I just mentioned, with the PDL1 PDL expression of 50% or higher, exposed to this type of treatment uh, with PD1 inhibition, um, in this case, pembrolizumab. It could be shown that uh, those patients that uh, in the tumor carried a KRAS mutation and in addition, an SDK11 or KIOP mutation um, um, showed worse outcome uh, do, uh, as represented here by the red curves in the upper part of the Kaplan-Meier plot compared to the blue curves. Uh, those are the one with KRAS mutation, but without additional uh, SDK11 or KIOP. And this is completely different if it's KRAS wild type, here those additional mutations don't matter, outcome is similar. So here it could be shown that these molecular features matter to show how the prognosis is looking like and how the outcome according to this IO monotherapy uh, is different. And this might give, uh, might, uh, might give um, 
uh, energy uh, to the hypothesis and raise the hypothesis uh, that those patients, for instance, with KRS mutation, the SDK11 mutations, need a different type of treatment upfront than IO monotherapy or chemotherapy with IO monotherapy. I will come to that back later with my presentation. At least if you look on the pie chart, uh, on, on, not on the pie chart, uh, on the overview graph, um, showing us uh, the different treatment options in first line metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, you see it's, it's, it's uh, plenty of options. And uh, the attrition according to the respective treatments uh, is driven by the PDL1 expression and the histology. And we see independent from histology in PDL1 PD high expresses over 50%, we have different trial options, Kino24, Empower 110, Empower 01, uh, uh, which are reflecting different compounds from the PD1 or PDL1 treatment options. And those are Pemperizumab, Atezolizumab, and Siniplimab, to name uh, those here. And uh, then, moreover, According to histology, there is Keynote 189 and Keynote 407 or Impower 150, Impower 130. These are trials that combine IO monotherapy with chemotherapy. And these are further options that are introduced into the treatment landscape here in addition. And just now, Empower 03 received approval in patients with a PDL1 expression over 1% independent from histology. And this is semiplimab in combination with any type of chemotherapy. In combination with chemotherapy and here again then combined IO approaches, uh, these trials are Checkmate 9LA and Poseidon. And in Checkmate 9LA, it's a combination of anti-PD-1 with anti-CTLA4 and Poseidon is anti-PDL1 with anti-CTLA4. So it's PD1 and PDL1. This is the difference between those two trials. And um, as the uh, uh, Poseidon trial just now received approval, I will uh, show you that in the next uh, minutes. But first, I would like to introduce you a little bit uh, on the efficiency rates, long-term efficiency rates of um, chemotherapy combined with IO monotherapy. And here, chemotherapy with anti-PD-1 treatment. And the first compound introduced in the field here has been, again, pemperizumab. And we see in this combination strategies, the five-year survival rates uh, are meeting a proportion of 20% in the total population. It's 19.4 and 18.4 according to the respective histologies. And I already introduced you into the results from Keynote 024, where we had a five-year survival rate of 30% uh, in the high expressing population. And this again is met in Keynote 189 in combination with chemotherapy, again, 30%. And in the keynote 407, uh, it's not so much favorable. Uh, it's in the midst of the 20% range for squamous cell carcinoma. So, uh, but in comparison to chemotherapy, these are really steps forward again here. And uh, these are uh, further opportunities combination of uh, chemotherapy with IO monotherapy for those patients. And if we, uh, sum this up in an oversight table, we can state that by these options, five-year survival rates are 30% in the high expresses and around 20% in the total population. If you look on stage three disease, which is local regional advanced, mostly not prone to surgery, then those patients receive um, chemotherapy in combination with radiotherapy to control their disease. And um, some years ago, uh, in addition, uh, anti pdl one treatment has been introduced as an adjuvant option. Uh, and in this case, uh, durvalumab. 
And in the trial which started that and conducted that, uh, we saw a five-year survival rate of the total population of 43% and in the patient population with a pedial one expression of 1% or higher of 50%, which is here the Pacific trial. And you see uh, the both Kaplan-Meier plots indicating that. And uh, this is um, putting evidence uh, in this field as well that patients with local regional advanced disease and radiochemotherapy are benefiting from um, adjuvant uh, anti pdl one treatment. And in Europe, the approval is given for patients with a pdl one expression of 1% or higher. And with this, now I step back to uh, the Checkmate 9LA and Poseidon. These are the uh, trials that I already introduced to you with a combination of anti-PD-1 or anti pdl one with anti-CDL4 with combination chemotherapy. Uh, and very recently, Poseidon received approval just in the last weeks. And here, uh, this trial uh, compared uh, chemotherapy versus chemotherapy plus, plus anti-PDL1, uh, duovolumab, or uh, in addition, uh, in uh, conjunction with duovolumab, anti-CDL4, in this case here, tremolumab. And you see, for the quadruple combination, we have the best hazard ratio of 0.75 uh, with a four-year survival rate uh, of 20% for those patients. And uh, if we look at the forest lot, we see a differential efficiency according to histology. And uh, here it's indicated that the utmost benefits are those with a non-squamous histology uh, with, a, with a hazard ratio substantially lower than uh, 0.75. And uh, here on the next slide, this is depicted. If you look on the non-squamous population, we have this favorable hazard ratio with a four-year survival rate of 25%. Um, so some percent even better than in the total population where it's only 20. And uh, for the chemotherapy only population, it's around 10%. So this is a very huge difference here. And um, it seems to be the case that particularly for this histology, this combination has the best benefit. And here now in this part of non-squamous, uh, further uh, results on SDK11 alteration and KIRP alteration and KRS alteration um, have been made available. Uh, last ESMO meeting, uh, these uh, Kaplan-Meier plots, which are absolutely exploratory, have been presented. And uh, the information is that even due to SDK11 mutation or KIRP mutation, patients with this quadruple um, um, uh, type of uh, treatment seem to benefit. This is exploratory, it's retrospective, it's a signal that shows that, that perhaps those patients might be forwarded to this type of combination treatment at best. But this is, uh, in, in, in my perception, uh, it's a hypothesis which has to be further explored and, and validated and is showing how important it is and it will become in the future to have this molecular information even in the treatment scenario with immunotherapy. And here I would like to sum up that substantial progress has been made, but advancements are imperative, particularly to customize ICI immune checkpoint inhibition uh, to the respective patient populations. And this is even uh, very important if we look you know, on the next treatment options that we have available for those patients if they fail to first line then it's uh, becoming very sparse, uh, the opportunities. And uh, you see here different options that have been tested, not after failure of direct chemo IO, but uh, failure after chemotherapy. And here we have um, in the second line scenario, no substantial response rates to expect 
almost less than 10 percent and progression free survival in the median is almost less than three months so very limited very sparse options and this is a reason why now after failure of chemo io different opportunities are tested in terms of antibody drug conjugates as listed here new uh, immune checkpoint targets or combination of checkpoint inhibition with receptor tyrosine kinase inhibition or um, uh, checkpoint inhibition with anti digit checkpoint inhibition so different options are currently explored and it's very important to deepen the understanding and here again uh, a nice approach from Recuti and co-workers uh, that has been presented last ESCO meeting. What did they do? They followed up their patient cohorts with sequential biomaterial acquisition here with sequential biopsy taking. Uh, and in this patient population was around 60 patients uh, which have been exposed to uh, different types of immunotherapy. They could show that uh, the genetic landscape uh, if you explore the genetic landscape in appropriate depths, could confer additional information on the potential mode of resistance. So they described uh, in around 10% of patients the occurrence of an SDK11 mutation, uh, which um, is uh, contributing uh, to a microenvironment, uh, which might then uh, bring checkpoint inhibition into an inefficiency. And uh, the same uh, to say here for loss of function mutations in the beta-2 microglobulin. And this could be detected in around 8% of patients. So if you do this type of exploration, you might uh, achieve further information, which might help you uh, to uh, move forward on next steps of treatment to um, scavenger those patients and induce again a remission if possible. Uh, and with that now, uh, I would like to move forward into the perioperative treatment setting. And here uh, it's important uh, to state that even in uh, small tumors, uh, let's say two centimeter tumor, one or two peribronchial lymph nodes involved. This is stage 2B disease. Uh, the overall survival is not overriding 50% substantially. So it's very important to have improvements here. Uh, attempts of improvements have been made with chemotherapy um, 15 years ago, introduced, and we see here that the um, um, survival rates are improving, but it's not substantial. It's four to five percent, so it's um, a little, a very little step forward. And in the very recent past, it has been shown that it might be important to know the genetic landscape here as well. At least it could be shown for activating EGFR mutations. That's the additional treatment with ozimertinib uh, is, is putting substantial benefit on the improvement of um, the disease-free survival uh, with uh, hazard ratios uh, of uh, 0.4, of 0.3, and 0.2 in the disease-free survival. And we uh, note that the four-year disease-free survival is ranging from 80 to 65% in the different subgroups compared to 59 to 14%. So substantial steps forward. But in addition to mention here, uh, or not but, perhaps for further information to mention here that ctDNA dragging and ctDNA drop down might matter here in this part of the population as well to guide treatment here this nice exploration uh, from uh, south korea uh, presented by Ahn and co-workers last, last esmo here it could be shown that in patients uh, treated with surgery with an egfr alteration and they had a huge population 278 patients predominantly patients with stage one disease it could be shown if patients had no ctDNA detectable upfront to surgery or had a ctDNA drop down after surgery, had a favorable three-year disease-free rate of 80% compared to only 50% if patients had a ctDNA um, detection prior to surgery and no drop down. 
So the node drop downers seem to be those ones that carry the worst prognosis and perhaps those are the ones that particularly benefit from treatment with TKIs like ozimertinib. Um, we will see an update on the at Aura trial, this ESCO meeting, and perhaps further information on the CTDNA dynamics are implemented here as well. And now for the last minutes, I would like to show you the impact of checkpoint inhibition, uh, utilization of microenvironment in the perioperative treatment scenario. The first trial who now moved in a type of um, checkpoint inhibition in the perioperative setting has been Empower 10. And this trial tested the impact of atezolizumab after complete tumor resection and adjuvant chemotherapy. And as you see in the patient population with PDL1 expression, there is an advantage with a hazard ratio of 0.66, but the utmost advantage is in the patient population with a PDL1 expression of 50% or higher. Here, the hazard ratio is 0.43. And uh, in Europe, atezolizumab received approval for this patient population, and currently uh, uh, patients are then tested. Uh, in terms of genomic alterations, in terms of PDL1 expression, and those patients without targetable genomic alterations, particularly acti activating EGFR mutations, uh, but a PDL1 expression over 50% would benefit from adjuvant atezolizumab treatment. Turning this a little bit around, another perspective could be to employ immunotherapy alone or in combination with chemotherapy prior to surgery. So induction, neoadjuvant. Uh, from a conceptual frame, the advantage could be that you have a broader T-cell response, a more diverse response uh, of the T-cells to different antigens, more intense response with a higher clonality and potentially uh, a more sustained response with a longer T-cell propagation, which of course uh, is, is important if the tumor is taken out, you would like to have a long-standing propagation and long-standing control of micrometastasis. And here perhaps an early readout on the efficiency could be the pathologic response in the resection specimen. And this is reflected here. Uh, this is just a taxonomy of the different response rate. PCR means pathologic complete response. MPR means major pathologic response with a viable tumor proportion of less than 10%. And you see here, uh, the numbers with CTX, with this, which is chemotherapy, with immunotherapy only, and with chemotherapy in combination with immunotherapy. And you see the best PCR rates and MPR rates are achieved with uh, the combination of chemo with IO, with around 30 and 60% respectively. And uh, in how far this might mirror uh, the treatment efficiency, uh, could be delineated from this exploratory analysis from such an induction trial, which is Checkmate 816. Uh, three cycles of nivolumab in combination with chemotherapy have been here uh, uh, employed in the exploratory treatment arm. And you see there are differences in the event free survival by PDL1 expression. At best, again, patients with PDL1 expression over 50% benefit here with a hazard ratio of 0.24. But uh, in terms of um, outcome with reflection on the pathologic complete response rate, uh, you, uh, I would like to drive your attention to the lower part here, to the uh, Kaplan-Meier plot. First to mention that the PCR rate is increased tenfold if you employ nivolumab compared to chemotherapy only. It's 24% compared to 2.2. And those patients with a PCR uh, reflected here in the in the in the green curve with nivo chemo benefit uh, better than patients without a PCR uh, and and the hazard ratio for those patients with uh, nivo chemo uh, is uh, is uh, 0.13 so it's a real benefit if this is given and. Um, in how far pre-operative and post-operative CTDNA might matter here. Uh, so uh, it uh, in the upper part, it's reflected that around 
50% of patients with nevo chemo showed a CTDNA drop down. This is a, a green bar. And almost 50% of those patients again showed a pathologic complete response. So an additional proxy for PCR might be the CTDNA drop down. And CTDNA drop down is even indicating a superior or worse outcome as shown in the lower uh, graphs. This is an exploration by Cancer Research UK, published in Annals of Oncology last year. And they just compared pre- and post-operative CTDNA. And the first graph shows if no pre-operative CTDNA is shown, patients have a better outcome. And uh, the second graph is showing if patients have post-operative still sustainable CTDNA detection, they have a far worse outcome with a uh, difference in the hazard ratio of around 10. And this shows that perhaps the exploration of CTDNA uh, perioperatively might help us to adopt treatment intensity. Uh, and these are strategical considerations uh, published by Sanz uh, Garcia and co-workers to adopt treatment according to the CTDNA dynamics. So uh, checking back on that might help to guide treatment in the future. And the perioperative and particularly the pre-operative treatment setting uh, is giving us various opportunities. Uh, it seems to be from a conceptual background help to intensify the immune response uh, by the markers that I just mentioned, uh, biomarkers over time like CTDNA or PCR and MPR as a single shot readout. Uh, Post-operative treatment potentially could be stratified according to those patient populations and uh, it's a window of opportunity because here different approaches could be explored and could be correlated with biomarkers either in the pinpoint setting or over time uh, if, we, if it comes to CTDNA uh, to explore different uh, opportunities, for instance, of checkpoint inhibitors and then adopt according to the prerequisites represented by exploration of the microenvironment or the genetic landscape uh, of the tumor itself, um, treatment strategies at best to those patients. So in my perception, the uh, induction uh, treatment option in the perioperative setting uh, is at least a window of opportunity to explore treatment options and then perhaps could be further um, um, moved forward into the treatment uh, setting of advanced disease or metastatic disease. And this uh, is to come in the very next future to design treatments in that way. And with that, thank you very much to be in this webinar on the uh, quickly evolving treatment landscape of non-small cell lung cancer. Thank you, Michael, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question for you today, Michael, is in lung cancer research, are there any significant advantages in using genetic analysis approach over traditional techniques such as histology? Yeah, definitely. This is the case um, uh, when you followed uh, the presentation that I provided, uh, you, you recognized uh, by this epidemiologic analysis that has been published in the New England Journal about two years ago, it could be shown that uh, there is a reduction uh, in lung cancer mortality in men and in women, which is uh, higher this reduction than the incidence of lung cancer. And this is uh, has been observed in conjunction with the introduction of target treatments, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. First one in this domain has been uh, the inhibition of the EGF receptor and the dominant activating mutations that have been described here are uh, um, exon 19 deletions and L858R mutations in exon 21. And these alterations uh, and further ones, like for instance, gene fusions and other mutations, 
uh, are detected by genetic analysis. So this is not possible by uh, histology itself uh, or additional IHC stainings, though you need this technology and these assessments. And if you then uh, employ the appropriate treatments to the relevant patient subgroups, um, patients are really going to benefit. This has been shown in the population-based analysis. And if you look cohort-based, if you know, for instance, uh, this patient has an ELK gene fusion and you introduce the appropriate treatments, you could expect a five-year survival rate of over 60%, which has been impossible and uh, not been considerable um, about 15 years ago. So this is a real uh, strong step forward. And diagnostic is key here uh, in uh, this uh, domain uh, to have appropriate patient attrition. Wow, thank you for that. That's so helpful. Um, the next question that we have, uh, what are the benefits of qPCR and NGS uh, complementary with each other in trans uh, translational cancer research? Yeah, could be. Uh, this depends at least on the strategy that you are pursuing and um, in, in, you know, in which clinical frame and in which type of uh, exploration uh, you are introducing uh, these technologies. So NGS uh, could provide you with a complete overview on molecular alterations that might be given. So um, the NGS strategy uh, is, is really important to have it if it comes to upfront exploration of, of, of tissue and the molecular landscape the patient might carry and if you or the tumor might carry and if you know a defined alteration is there uh, then it might be important to track over time what is happening is it is it um, um, reappearing is it extinguished by the treatment that you're uh, that you're conducting and uh, this could be tracked by circulating tumor DNA. And if you have this strategy here, qPCR could be an appropriate technology uh, to track over time defined alterations in terms of um, getting insights on the efficiency of treatment, inefficiency of treatment, relapse. Um, and uh, this then would make sense uh, if you can link consequences to the insights that you are gaining with this type of um, follow-up surveillance. Wow, that seems very useful. Thank you so much for that. Um, the next question that we have is, what are your thoughts on using multi-omics approach to identify new tar targets and biomarkers, especially when dealing with more precision-oriented treatments? Um, yeah, uh, multi-omics approaches um, might gain insights that are relevant. So, for instance, just to take a simple example, uh, it could be shown by cohort exploration strategies with in-depth molecular phenotyping of those patient cohorts that in the conjunction with immunotherapy, uh, immunotherapy by its own or in combination with chemotherapy, defined populations might have not such a beneficial outcome. For instance, it could be shown that patients that carry a KRAS mutation and in addition an SDK11 or KIRP mutation don't benefit uh, in appropriate way from immunomonotherapy, even if they carry a high pdl one expression. And this is uh, just an observation by retrospective cohort exploration. If you now think this forward and you would provide a broad scaled multi-omics approach or even multi-level characterization in addition to the genetic alterations, perhaps looking on uh, um, cellular composition of the microenvironment, if you would go for decomposition strategies, for instance, with nanostring analysis to get some insights and information here. This could be something which really could help you to better uh, guide uh, treatment options like immunotherapy. And here in the next future combinations, combination strategies come around the corner 
for instance, uh, targets that uh, are tackling lag three uh, are under exploration, just to give this example. And for this sole target, different antibodies are currently tested. So it's getting very quickly, very crowded. And here, appropriate guidance would be key. And here, multi-omics could be something which is really going to matter in the future. And again, here it's important to link the strategies to appropriate trial exploration efforts um, to gain relevant insights to better customize treatment. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we have time for one more question today. Our last question this morning is, how is the introduction of different ways in treatment of lung cancer, as mentioned in the webinar, relevant on the basis of population extent? Yeah, it's it's very important. Uh, as, as you uh, perceived, um, immunotherapy has been introduced in the field uh, starting in 2016, 2015, 2016. Uh, first in second-line metastatic disease, then in first-line metastatic disease uh, in defined patient populations. Now it's spread overall uh, in the metastatic non-small cell lung cancer field in local regional advanced disease. Uh, and it's now even moving further forward into perioperative treatment options in the perioperative treatment field. And uh, so here in the future, it will be very important uh, to better define patient subgroups that benefit from defined strategies. I just mentioned combination efforts that are currently undertaken. So it's, it's, it's very important for the next 10 years uh, to better understand which patient subgroups might um, uh, benefit from which types of combination either in the field of uh, immunotherapy or uh, in the field of molecular alterations. A further example that uh, we can uh, cut out of my presentation is, for instance, KRAS mutation G12C. There is an effective treatment or uh, an TKI and a GDBase inhibitor. It's not a TKI inhibitor, a GDBase inhibitor out that shows some efficiency response rate about 20 to 30 percent progression free survival six to seven months so it's efficient but it's no ultimately efficient and here then it's important to better understand which combination strategies might might work here in the future so um, it's very important um, uh, to to better understand uh, which patient subgroup in which treatment line is benefiting from which strategy Sure, that makes sense. Thank you for that. Um, thank you, Michael, for your impor informative presentation. Um, so uh, we just want to uh, ask you if you have any final comments for the uh, audience today. Well, thanks for participating and being here in the webinar. Uh, as you have seen, thoracic oncology here on the example of non-small cell lung cancer is a very exciting field. Never ever this would have been expected 15 years ago. It's, it's very exciting now uh, and there's a bright future. Uh, so thanks for being with us here. If you might have further questions, please forward those by, uh, by mail or so. Would be happy to answer so. Thank you. Excellent. Yes. Thank you again, Michael, for your time today and your important research. Uh, we would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Uh, this webcast can be viewed on demand. Uh, LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.